Our next presentation is about evolutionary breeding and alternative dryland crops for the Palouse. Um, we are really excited to have Kevin Murphy from the WSU Sustainable Seed Systems Lab with us today. Okay, yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak here. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure. So yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to give you a brief glimpse into some of the research we conduct in my lab at Washington State University that really focuses on introducing crop diversity and gen genetic diversity across the landscape and into the existing wheat-based cropping systems of the Palouse. So really trying to diversify the Palouse with um, dry land grains. And just thanks to Iris for mentioning um, seeds and locally adapted seeds. That's a lot of what we try and do and agree that that's, that's really important. So. Um, I direct the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab at Washington State University. I invite you to take a look at our website. It's just Sustainable Seed Systems Lab, you can, easy to find. And if you're interested in our research, um, we'll be co-hosting or coordinating a field day with Colette and Ali and their team, uh, July 7th and 8th, and we'd love to have you there. So a quick plug for that. Um, one of our goals in, in our lab is to increase cropping diversity and we do this by focusing on grain and seed crops that fill they fill both ecological niches in existing cropping systems as well as nutritional niches in our diet so here's a few of the crops you can see that we're working on um, food barley proso millet buckwheat spelt quinoa and perennial grains and we'll have some of these at the field day as well um, so as we test and trial these new crops uh, it's really critical that we evaluate them within existing cropping rotations. So this photo shows a four-year trial conducted by Rachel Wimi, where she tested quinoa in every possible cropping sequence with spring barley, spring wheat, and chickpeas. And so this study really helped us determine which rotation suppressed weeds the best and which were most productive and profitable for farmers on the Palouse. Um, so moving now from crop diversity to genetic diversity within each crop. So evolutionary breeding really encourages functional genetic diversity on a field scale, which allows for adaptation of crops to changes in climate, to two new races of disease costs, causing pathogens to extremes of heat, of cold, drought, moisture, um, and ends up by resulting in a more resilient resilient agricultural system. And this photo is Elwell River spelt. And I just want to point out that it's a nice variety, but it's one variety. It's very uniform. And we're trying to diversify the landscape as well. So this is the same spelt variety, but you can see um, in the two inset photos that we are also working on an evolutionary breeding spelt. And this is developed by crossing spelt uh, Elwell with some old world land race spelts from Germany. And we grow these out each year in contrast to Elwell River spelt where every plant is genetically identical. Plants in these evolutionary populations, every single one is genetically distinct and unique. So it's really exciting. Spelt, spelt is one of the crops we're working on. Here's another one, quinoa. And so in the background, you can see a beautiful variety of quinoa being grown in Idaho. And uh, in the inset though, that is our uh, quinoa evolutionary breeding population or one of them. And so you can just see the difference in diversity there. And both, both of these strategies are fine, but uh, showing you the difference in diversity is really important and maintaining these genetically diverse ev evolutionary populations really allow us to, to work with farmers to improve these populations and drive them through the farmer selection process in a direction that allows for increased adaptation to the particular soil and climatic conditions present on the farm where it's being grown. So it can evolve to become adapted to that farm. And this is my student, Julianne Kellogg, who's done a lot of work with um, farmers in this regard. And, and so these farmers can also release um, or yeah, select varieties of their own. You can see a couple of varieties that have been selected by farmers from this population. And, um, and so yeah, this, this type of work can be done 
by farmers on their farms. It's economical, it's efficient, it doesn't take a lot of time and it's really exciting and fun to do as well. And so can even do this work in your backyard garden if you're interested. So I, I've been doing this for the last five years, growing buckwheat in my garden, um, crossing it and growing it out and getting it adapted to the area. And now it's being tested across uh, Washington and hopefully Idaho soon. So thank you for your attention. I know I've covered a lot here, but just wanted to get give you all a glimpse of some of the ways we work towards increasing crop diversity, um, genetic diversity, and then really uh, overall landscape diversity. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Kevin. We will make sure that everybody gets an invitation to the the field day, which we're calling the Inland Northwest Artisan Grains Experience this coming July. So mark your calendars for the 7th and 8th. That was a beautiful presentation.